This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. President Biden wraps up his trip to France by paying respects to American veterans while calling on Americans to not forget the power of allies. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao brings us more from Paris. And President Biden on Sunday wrapped up his five-day trip to France by visiting the final resting place of more than 2,000 U.S. soldiers who died fighting in World War I. Biden, paying his respect, said he wanted to remind Americans of the importance of allies. The knowledge that the best way to avoid these kinds of battles in the future is to stay strong with our allies. Do not break. Do not break. Over the weekend, Biden also met with French President Emmanuel Macron, after which he stressed the need to keep NATO strong and vowed to continue supporting Ukraine. Because we know what happens if Putin succeeds in, in subjugating Ukraine. And it won't, we won't stop, you know, you know Putin not going to stop at Ukraine. In the several speeches he gave in France, Biden avoided mentioning the name of his 2024 rival, former President Trump. He even declined to answer a question about Trump on Sunday. But his 2024 message was clear throughout this trip. He's seeking to contrast his foreign policy with Trump's by drawing from history to highlight his view that America needs to stand with allies and avoid becoming what he called semi-isolationist. That can also be seen when Biden in Paris last week apologized to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky for the delay in sending U.S. aid, on which he further commented on Sunday. It just, it's just, it's not who we are. It's not who America is. Meanwhile, Biden, who's back in D.C. for a few days, will soon head back to Europe, this time to Italy for the G7 summit this week. He'll talk with G7 leaders about how to further support Ukraine and to strengthen U.S. alliances on the world stage, a key theme to his 2024 campaign. He'll also again meet with Zelensky in Italy just a few days after sitting down with him right here in Paris. Reporting in Paris, Iris Tao, NTD News. Europe just took a big step to the right in recent elections. In France, President Emmanuel Macron's party suffered a major defeat, prompting him to call for a snap election. NTD's international correspondent Arian Pazdar has a roundup. French President Emmanuel Macron has dissolved the country's parliament and called for an election. His party is set for a heavy defeat at the hands of Marine Le Pen's national rally. Exit polls showed national rally with more than double the share of votes as the ruling party. For me, who has always considered Europe to be united, strong, independent and good for France, this is a situation that I cannot come to terms with. Le Pen spoke on the results on Monday, saying she's open to work with other parties. I think we have an historic chance to allow the national movement to put France back on track. And for this, we must be able to bring together, to open up to all men and women of goodwill who are patriots. In Germany, the ruling Social Democrats and the Green Party suffered a major blow, according to the exit polls. The Alternative for Germany party came in second. That's as more Germans expressed long-held concerns about the country's immigration policies. The votes for right-wing populist parties here and in other European countries must worry us. We must never get used to this, and it must always be our mission to push them back and to ensure that there are clear, clear majorities in favor of parties that have made a clear commitment to our democracy, to the rule of law, to what still defines us as a European Union, and that they also represent this. In Italy, Premier Giorgia Meloni's Brothers of Italy doubled their seats in the European Parliament. The party advocates for strong national sovereignty, traditional family values and a tough stance on immigration. In Hungary, right-leaning Prime Minister Viktor Orban's party came out on top, but with a lower vote share than before. Political newcomer Peter Magyar, who broke from Orban's party earlier this year, led his new party to second place. Magyar is promising to root out corruption and revive democratic checks and balances. Arian Pastar, NTD News. The United Nations Security Council just backed a U.S. ceasefire proposal for the Israel-Hamas war. The plan was outlined by President Biden and it sets out conditions for a hostage and prisoner swap. 
The plan was finalized after six days of negotiations within the council. A resolution needs at least nine votes in favor and no vetoes by the U.S., France, Britain, China or Russia to pass. Among the members, China did not block the proposal and Russia abstained. This marks the bloc's first time to agree to a ceasefire plan. And in Israel, Minister Benny Gantz quit the country's three-man war cabinet yesterday. He's from a different party as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and initially joined the war cabinet as a show of unity against Hamas. Gantz is calling on Netanyahu to agree to an election date. Over the weekend, Israel rescued four hostages in the Gaza Strip. But the Hamas-run health ministry said hundreds of people died during the rescue operation. NTD's Jason Perry has the latest and a warning. This report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. On Saturday, Israel conducted a hostage rescue mission in the central Gaza Strip in the middle of the day. In a joint operation, the IDF, the Israel Security Agency, and the Israeli police rescued four hostages. This video, released by the Israeli Police and Security Service, shows three of the hostages being rescued, followed by heavy gunfire as they tried to make their way to safety. And once they got on the helicopter, an Israeli troop asked them if it was their first time on a helicopter and then explained to them where they were going to land in Israel. The other hostage, Noah Argarmani, was rescued in the same mission but from a different location. She's seen in this video from October 7th being driven away on the back of this motorcycle while her boyfriend, who's still in captivity, was being escorted by terrorists. And after eight months of captivity, the former hostages reunited with their loved ones. I want to thank the qualified, humane and most moral army in the world. There's no such army in the world. And the IDF called out Al Jazeera because reportedly one of their journalists, Abdullah Al Jamal, was holding three of the hostages. The Hamas media reported that 274 people were killed in the hostage rescue operation, although this number is not independently verified. They also said that three hostages were killed in the operation, but the IDF called that a blatant lie. A resident in the Gaza Strip recalled what happened on that day. This is our house. We were safely sitting in it, and suddenly several consecutive explosions happened. We did not know what was happening. There are still children under this building. We don't know how to pull them out. Meanwhile, on Monday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with officials in Egypt and in Israel as he tries to push forward a ceasefire deal to release the remaining 120 hostages held in the Gaza Strip. Blinken said Israel has agreed to the latest ceasefire deal and they are waiting on Hamas to accept it. Jason Perry, NTD News. The U.S. is reportedly close to finalizing a treaty with Saudi Arabia. This could have far-reaching implications for Israel. It could also help keep the Chinese regime's influence out of the region. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley brings us this report. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that this treaty, known as the Strategic Alliance Agreement, is nearly finalized, and that this would mean the U.S. would come to Saudi Arabia's aid if it were ever attacked. It would also likely open up ties between the country and Israel. This treaty is modeled after the U.S. security relationship with Japan. It would grant Washington access to Saudi territory and airspace to protect U.S. allies. It would also prohibit the Chinese regime from building military bases in the region or forming security ties. Saudi Arabia and Iran are competing for regional supremacy. In 2019, Iran-backed Houthi rebels attacked oil fields in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the world's largest exporter of oil, so the attack disrupted the global oil market. The treaty could risk increasing tensions with Iran, but it would bolster the country's security alliance with the U.S. The agreement would make Saudi Arabia the only Arab state with a formal U.S. defense treaty. Although it's not conditional, the Saudis want to see an end to the war in Gaza and a plan for a Palestinian state. And right now, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in the Middle East calling on leaders to press Hamas for a ceasefire deal. If you want a ceasefire, press Hamas to say yes. If you want to alleviate the terrible suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, press Hamas to say yes. 
If you want to get all the hostages home, press Hamas to say yes. This comes after Israeli forces over the weekend rescued four hostages that were held by Hamas since October. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry had recorded 270 Palestinians that were killed in the operation, according to the Hamas terrorist figures. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Congress will review its 2025 defense appropriations bill this week. The House and Senate have different priorities, with House Republicans looking to cut costs and GOP senators hoping to increase it. NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has the details. The House Rules Committee will review this Tuesday the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2025. House appropriators have allocated $833 billion to fund the Department of Defense for the coming year. That's 1% higher than last year and in keeping with the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2024. The House's defense bill cuts $18 billion from the president's budget request and redirects most of those funds to efforts to counter China, drug trafficking, and funding a 4.5% pay rise for all military personnel and a 15% pay boost for junior enlisted service members. It's expected that Speaker of the House Mike Johnson will put the House's version of the defense bill to a vote on the House floor this week. Also this week, behind closed doors, the Senate's Armed Services Committee will mark up its version of the defense bill. Republican Senator Roger Wick from Mississippi has already introduced an amendment to increase defense spending by $55 billion. I recently introduced a detailed plan to rebuild American military might and restore our ability to deter threats. It would be a down payment for our future, and it would be expensive. Many worthwhile things are expensive, but it would be far less costly than war. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has endorsed the amendment, which also calls to increase military spending from 2.9% of GDP to 5% over time. Senate Appropriations Committee Chairwoman Senator Patty Murray from Washington has already said that any defense increase should be matched with similar non-defense spending increases. It's important to note that according to the Congressional Budget Office, the U.S. government will pay more than $950 billion to services foreign debt in 2025. That's $100 billion more than projected defense spending. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The Hunter Biden jury began deliberations today as attorneys completed closing arguments in a busy Delaware court. The president's son faces possible jail time if he's convicted of felony gun charges. He chose not to take the stand. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards has more details. In a Delaware courtroom Monday where several of Hunter Biden's family members filled the first row of seats, Prosecutor Leo Wise cautioned the jury to not be distracted. All of this is not evidence, Wise said while gesturing around the courtroom. People sitting in the gallery are not evidence. No one is above the law, he said. Wise recapped the six-day trial by highlighting what he called ugly and overwhelming evidence. The president's son is charged with three felonies stemming from the October 2018 purchase of a gun that he had for about 11 days. Prosecutors say he lied on a mandatory gun purchase form by saying he was not illegally using or addicted to drugs. If he is found guilty, the president's son could face up to 25 years behind bars. He has pleaded not guilty. President Biden confirmed in a recent ABC interview that he will not pardon his son. But let me ask you, will you accept the jury's outcome, their verdict, no matter what it is? Yes. And have you ruled out a pardon for your son? Yes. Wise said the evidence shows the younger Biden knew he was a user of or addicted to crack cocaine when he answered no to the question. He re-showed the jury text message exchanges Hunter had with his brother's widow, Hallie Biden, in October 2018. Wise said the messages show Hunter was buying drugs in October. The prosecution also highlighted Hunter's own words about his addiction written in his 2021 memoir. The defense rested its case without calling Hunter to the stand. During closing arguments, Hunter's attorney, Abby Lowell, focused on the word knowingly, saying Hunter's state of mind at the time of the gun purchase is critical. He also tried to undercut testimony from the former girlfriends. 
arguing that Hunter had a habit of lying to Halley about his whereabouts. Poor Halley Biden, he said. He told the jury that Hunter's memoir was not a diary entry, but rather a look back at his journey. He defended how Hunter handled the gun, arguing that he kept it in his truck, unloaded, and in a lockbox. Lowell accused Halley of using a code she knew to open the box. The attorneys completed closing arguments before the court adjourned for the day. The jury began deliberations around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Former President Trump attended a virtual meeting with a New York City probation officer today. The probation interview is a standard procedure in most criminal court systems and required as part of the pre-sentencing report. Normally the meetings are held in person, but Trump was permitted to stay in his Florida home with his attorney by his side. The interview is part of a pre-sentencing report that Judge Juan Mershon will use as a guide for his sentencing decision. A jury found the former president guilty of 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in a historic criminal case. He faces up to four years in prison or probation. Judge Mershon has scheduled the sentencing hearing for July 11th. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. President Biden might give legal status to undocumented immigrants who are married to American citizens. A spokesperson for the Biden campaign commented on the plans today. President Biden has had to take matters into his own hands by issuing executive actions that will, 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 will improve the situation at the border because Congress failed to act. And Congress failed to act again, not because of Democrats, but because of MAGA Republicans. This comes just days after President Biden issued an executive order aimed at limiting the number of illegal border crossings. A U.S. Border, border Patrol officer told Reuters that Friday saw a drop in people trying to enter the country illegally. According to him, Border Patrol arrested around 3,100 people crossing illegally that day. NTD can't verify the number, but if accurate, that's down roughly 20 percent from the days before. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas praised the development. He called it a very big shift in how the government operates the southern border. Earlier, I spoke with Javier Palomares, founder and CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Business Council, about President Biden's executive action on the border and work permits for migrants. Javier Palomares, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Tiffany. Now, following President Biden's executive action on the border last week, pro-immigration groups are pushing for work permits for illegal immigrants. How do you view this, especially the impact on local businesses, but also the communities? Well, first of all, let me say, Tiffany, that in, 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 the, in the case of the executive action, it's one of those situations where it's kind of like uh, better late than never. So, so I'm supportive of the executive action. Uh, in terms of uh, people calling for work visas, I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, we uh, represent the 4.8 million Hispanic-owned firms in this country that collectively contribute over $850 billion to the American economy. And many of those companies are in the agricultural space, in the construction space, in manufacturing, transportation, uh, and hospitality. And these are the industries that have now been suffering for some time in terms of work uh, shortages. They don't have enough employees. So I happen to believe, our association believes that work permits done legally, done in an orderly fashion, are good for the American people and are good for the American economy. To your point, many have said that America was built by immigrants. And we have Illinois State Representative Lisa Hernandez saying, quote, the time for executive action is now. You also have a group of pro-immigrant organizations saying that more than 400,000 immigrants have worked for decades without work permits across Illinois, but that they've been paying taxes and all of that. Given that, how should America handle illegal immigration? Work permits seem like maybe a temporary solution. How should we deal with this? You know, I think work permits are a part of the solution. They are by no means the, the, the comprehensive solution that is required. The fact of the matter is, you know, under this administration, and, and I'm a Democrat, as you well know, Tiffany, but under this administration, we have had more than 7 million people enter through our southern border illegally. And um, that is equivalent to all of the Americans living in the states of Delaware, uh, Vermont, Rhode Island, 
uh, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Alaska combined. So think about that. The fact of the matter is there is a crisis on the border. That needs to be priority number one. We need to figure out how we're going to solve the current crisis. Right now, we have over 4 million people in the process waiting for asylum. To get through those that backlog of 4 million people, it will take our system more than seven years. That's just to handle the backlog that we're dealing with. So clearly, we have to be you know, open-minded and clear-eyed about the situation at the border. It is a crisis. It needs to be handled. We can do it. Above and beyond that, on a going forward basis, the American economy, frankly, relies on immigrant labor. And to your point, America was built by, Ameri by immigrants. And so I think there is a place here for business and the commercial interests of our nation and our elected officials to come together with a comprehensive solution, again, that will benefit the American people and benefit the American economy. To your point, polls show that immigration is a top concern for voters, given this is an election year. Now, this is an issue that both sides have seized on. What do you think is being left out of the conversation when it comes to this? I'm glad you asked, Tiffany, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the presidential debates. I've been hearing a lot of the rhetoric back and forth. But all too often, they leave out the missing piece, which is the fact that we have to have a comprehensive solution and one that considers the commercial and economic interests of our nation and that allows our industries, again, like hospitality, construction, manufacturing, and agriculture, to hire the needed labor they need. Um, at this juncture, if we continue as we are going with these kind of less than 100% employment in those industries, prices will continue to go up. Eventually, we're gonna see shortages of some products. And so that can be alleviated by having the right system in place. I'd like to see on both sides of the aisle, these elected officials, instead of fear-mongering or politicizing this issue, looking at it as adults and frankly coming clean with the american people and saying listen there's a place for a steady flow of immigrants to keep our economy going but at the same time we need to keep you know national security and the safety of our american citizens uh you know front front and center there is a way to do it we are america we can handle this but we have to put the politic political issues aside and start working together as americans to solve this problem like you said, it's the United States of America. Javier Palomares, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tiffany. Appreciate it. Insurance companies could be tracking how you drive via smartphone apps. That includes how hard you brake when you drive, your speed, and more. Here's the story. Your driving habits may be under surveillance. Some apps, such as weather app MyRadar, parenting app Life360, and GasBuddy, let users opt in to features that can collect very specific driving information and send that information to insurance companies. GasBuddy says its features are meant to improve fuel efficiency. Only if you hit the privacy policy at the bottom of this screen and go through these waves of text do you see what information it collects and the fact it sends insurance companies this data. The speed of, at, at which you break, total number of miles driven, times of day driven. Um, they haven't really gone too heavy into average speeds yet, but that will be, that will be something that will be coming very soon. Um, the other thing that they do a lot of detection on is phone usage while driving. Ezra Peterson is a director at Way.com, a car super app that doesn't collect driving data without expressed consumer consent. He says unsafe drivers should be concerned about rate increases. Drivers that are typically poor behaving drivers that have somehow evaded the normal triggers that would cause rate increases. Meanwhile, good drivers can benefit from being tracked. Some insurers offer tracking services, which drivers willingly opt into. It's possible to save up to 30 to 40 percent versus standard auto insurance rates, but that just depends on, number one, your driving habits, and number two, what your 
individual insurer offers. Insurance expert Mark Friedlander says drivers who use these services are saving money and driving more safely because they know what data is being tracked. Joining me now to discuss the latest developments in the Middle East is Gerard Fidletti, Middle East Affairs Analyst and Senior Counsel at the Lawfare Project. Gerard, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you again. Now, to begin, the UN Security Council just approved a resolution backing President Biden's three-phase ceasefire hostage deal. That says Hamas says it's ready to work with mediators to reach an agreement. Now, phase two of that deal includes a permanent end to the hostilities and a full withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza. Now, Israel has said it will only agree to those terms after they meet their war objectives, which is destroying Hamas's military and governing capabilities. Given all of that, how do you read this latest development at the UN? This latest development is really an attempt to pressure Israel into giving up lost ground, so to speak, on the diplomatic front with the war. Uh, what it is, is a, a six, it's a six-month period for a first, first phase in which Israel withdraws from occupied areas in Gaza, where it's currently engaging in military activities, in exchange for the return of some hostages and the release, notably, of many prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, from Israeli prisons. Now, after a six-month period, we would be looking at a complete withdrawal of Israel from Gaza. The problem is that Israel's security objectives have not been met. What this proposal really does, what this UN-approved ceasefire deal really does, is to allow Hamas to continue operating as a governing force in Gaza, and it doesn't really change anything. It may have been degraded militarily, but it will still have the capability to control its people and, and make life miserable for Palestinians and wage war against Israel. Hmm. Now, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are close to finalizing a draft security deal, which officials say is modeled after the U.S.-Japan Mutual Security Pact. Now, it hinges on Israel's commitment to a Palestinian state, an end to the Gaza war, and it needs a two-thirds majority in the U.S. Senate. What is the significance of this treaty? How likely is it to pass? Well, this treaty is the carrot to the stick imposed by the Security Council. This is a way to entice Israel into uh, basically establishing a ceasefire and entering diplomatic solutions over Gaza and a potential Palestinian state in exchange for normalization of its relations with Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia and a lot of Arab countries engage in a boycott of Israel. They don't recognize its existence. There's no di direct diplomatic connections. And while there may be trade, it's indirect trade. Having normalized relations would be a big deal in the Middle East towards establishing stability and it would be a benefit both for Israel, for Saudi Arabia, and for other Gulf nations as well. So this is something that's been in the works for a while, but it's being pushed now by the Biden administration as a way to get Israel to the negotiating table. Now, the Wall Street Journal report also knows that the agreement would make Saudi Arabia the only Arab state with a former U.S. defense treaty. Just how significant is that part? It's very significant, but the significance also can be overstated. The United States has long had a commitment to Saudi Arabia, to other countries in the Middle East where we've had significant military presence and established military bases. So it's not without precedent that we've made some commitments to the safety of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and other countries in the region. But this is the first time it would be reduced to a formalized diplomatic writing, which would really change the scope of the Middle East and basically show that the United States is allied with countries that are standing in opposition to Iran and proponents of terrorism. Hmm. On that note, how important is Saudi Arabia as a player in the Middle East when it comes to peace and stability in the region? Well, Saudi Arabia occupies a very unique position in that the holiest sites of Islam are in Saudi Arabia, and it is seen as the guardian of those sites. So the legitimacy for Saudi Arabia as the voice of moderate Islam in the region cannot be understated, and it's very important towards gaining peace treaties, acceptance, and basically international uh, comedy uh, with the rest of the world by virtue of its position as guardian of those holy sites. So Saudi Arabia is in a very important position diplomatically, one which it is very effectively using right now. And Gerard, switching gears a bit, the IDF did a daring daytime operation in Gaza over the weekend and rescued four Israeli hostages who are still alive. Now, amidst the celebration, Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz resigned, saying on TV, quote, Netanyahu, or Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, prevents us from moving forward to a real victory in Gaza. How do you view this move by Benny Gantz? What's the impact on the war effort? 
in part, what we need to remember is that Benny Gantz is an opponent politically of Netanyahu and would very much like to form a government after Netanyahu is no longer in power. So there is some political motivation behind what he did. However, he does raise a point that Netanyahu has not really established a post-war priority and dis discussed how uh, Israel would be in relations with Gaza, whether it would continue as an occupying or a pacifying force, or whether it would resort to the same type of relationship as before October 7. So his point is valid, but it also comes from a position of he is a, co a competitor politically to Netanyahu. Gerard Fidlili, Middle East Affairs Analyst, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you so much. New York City has approved plans to build an offshore wind port in Brooklyn. Construction is set to revitalize the historic waterfront area and support homegrown power supplies. NTD's Fiona G was at the ceremony. A groundbreaking ceremony took place today at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, celebrating the finalization of a plan for energy company Equinor to build a large-scale offshore wind port right here. New York City's Mayor Eric Adams was present to share why he believes this plan is important to the city. 73 acres right here in Sunset Park will soon serve as an operation and maintenance hub for Empire Wind uh, One delivering, as it was indicated, 810 megawatts of renewable energy and launching a major new industry that will create jobs and be inclusive in the, the action. Speakers at today's event say that the 73-acre port will provide a significant increase in job opportunities for the local community, as well as helping the city to reach its 2040 climate goal of having 100% clean electricity. They also say that this proposed plan is an example of the cooperation between local, state and federal governments. Now the proposed end date for the construction of this port is 2026, at which point this will be the largest dedicated offshore wind port in the entire country. Fiona G, NTD News. A House lawmaker said one of his staffers was robbed at gunpoint in the nation's capital. As D.C.'s public safety situation continues to make headlines, do local residents feel safe living and commuting in the city? NTD's Sam Wong has more. Georgia Congressman Mike Collins said one of his staffers and a friend were robbed at gunpoint by three assailants in Washington, D.C. The incident reportedly took place on Sunday morning right here in the Navy Yard neighborhood. In a post on X, Collins said both victims were fine, but one of them wind up getting his watch taken away by a suspect. Bear in mind this is just the latest in a string of incidents where federal employees were attacked in broad daylight here in the nation's capital. With violent crimes remain a top issue, D.C. has been making headlines with shootings, armed carjackings, stabbings and manhunts. Even getting on the metro, I felt, you know, being unsafe, just walking in different areas and different parts of D.C. Right here at the Bet MGM, a guy got shot um, going into sports betting. That's a problem. The kids ransacking the CVS where we shop at, you know, that's a problem. D.C. has had a number of high-profile robberies in the past year. Last October, Texas Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar was carjacked at gunpoint right outside his home. He was left unharmed, but others weren't so lucky. In February, former Trump administration official Mike Gill was shot and killed in a carjacking spree. To combat violent crimes in the city, D.C. Mayor Mario Bowser in March signed an omnibus crime bill into law. The legislation sought to expand the definition of carjacking and penalties for gun crime. The only thing I can say for public safety is nobody's coming for you, go get a gun. We need more uh, police officers on the beat as a result of uh, all the growth and everything. Mary Bowser, the mayor, she needs to do a better job. And on Capitol Hill last month, the House passed the Sweeping D.C. Crimes Act, a bill that will block the city council from changing sentencing laws. It specifically seeks to cut off lenient treatment for youth offenders under the age of 18. But now it remains to be seen whether the legislation will be picked up by the Senate. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Sam Wong, NTD News. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is giving teachers a raise in the state's upcoming budget by more than a billion dollars. DeSantis says his administration is also giving cash to teachers to take a training course that teaches civics. We enacted the Civics Liter Literacy Excellence Initiative, which gives teachers $3,000 if they complete a first-of-its-kind civics training 
and they earned the newly created Civic Seal of Excellence endorsement to add to their teaching credentials. And so this is a course. We got some of the best scholars from around the country uh, to offer instruction about what are the foundations of America? What are the ideas? DeSantis also says he's made it easier for people who want to become public school teachers to earn their teaching certificates by offering more ways to become certified. The world's largest retailer is saying no to in-store panic buttons for its staff. Here is NTD's Don Ma with today's Business Matters. So the retail giant is saying that it is against putting panic buttons in stores. And this is a move that the New York legislature wants to require under a new law aimed at keeping retail workers safe. So on Friday, the New York State Senate passed a legislation that would make most big retail chains, and of course, that is including Walmart, to put panic buttons in their New York stores where employees can easily access them or provide staff with wearable or mobile phone activated panic buttons that summon emergency services. Now, the law, which is a reaction to rising threats to store clerks from thefts uh, as well as violence, was already passed by the state's assembly and now goes to Governor Kathy Hochul for signature. Retail groups, though, have criticized the law because installing the panic buttons, first of all, it's going to be costly. And Walmart's top corporate affairs officer told Reuters that the company opposes the panic button idea because it believes there are likely to be many false alarms. So eight out of 10 times somebody thinks something is going on, there's actually not. And this is according to Dan Barlett, Walmart executive vice president of corporate affairs on Friday. That's all from me. Back to you. The Port of Baltimore Channel could fully reopen in the next few days. Unified Command originally planned to reopen the 700-foot-wide channel this past weekend, but that didn't happen. On Sunday, the Army Corps of Engineers said salvage operators believe they have now fully cleared the area. Authorities are now inspecting the water with sonar and other tools to ensure there are no hazards to navigation. The channel has been closed since late March when a cargo ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, making it collapse into the river. The crash killed six construction workers who were on the bridge at the time. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today in sports, but let's start in the NBA where UConn's coach Dan Hurley has reportedly rejected the Lakers' lead coaching offer and will stay with the Huskies. Do you see this as a good fit? Yeah, I mean, he is such an offensive mastermind, especially. It would have been fun to see how this would have translated to the pro game. Plus, of course, LeBron James seems to be a big fan of him, so of course they want to keep James happy. Now, this was reported by ESPN today. This afternoon, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont posted on social media, our MVP coach is staying in Connecticut. Anyway, that clearly improves UConn's chances of a three-peat, though I wouldn't bet on it. I mean, no one's done that in like 50 years. But for the Lakers, I mean, it's back to the drawing board. Now, there had been one other prominent name rumored to be in the running. That's J.J. Redick, who's a former player turned TV analyst for ABC, who's calling these finals games right now. He said any reports or rumors about him and the Lakers will be addressed once the season is over. I think he'd make for a great head coach himself. He's very sharp. He's also very blunt. Uh, plus, he and LeBron also have a great relationship. So that works on several levels. Looking at those NBA finals, the Boston Celtics won game two last night and now have a 2 nothing lead over the Dallas Mavericks. What's jumped out at you as factors in this series? You know, I would say several things. I mean, one, the Boston crowd clearly is not over Kyrie Irving. You know, he used to play there. Uh, clearly, there are some hurt feelings over his time there. Now, he's been booed every time he touched the ball in this series. It's hard to believe it's not affecting his play. I mean, he's shot just 13 out of 37 from the floor. He's missed all three, eight of his eight three-point attempts. I would expect he'll shoot better in Dallas. Also, Jalen Brown's defense. We knew Drew Holiday and Derek White were very good. Brown has been on Luka Doncic most of the series. Doncic has at least gone for 30 points in every game, but he's committed 12 turnovers. Brown has picked his pocket clean a couple of times. I think also Boston's unselfish play. You know, they've got five guys, all their guys pretty much can play on the perimeter. They pass the ball so well, and they all play great defense. You could see why this team won more games than any other team in the regular season by a good amount.
There was some surprising news in women's basketball over the weekend as Caitlin Clark was left off the Olympic squad. Was there a reason given? You know, I didn't see it. I mean, I was pretty surprised by this too. I realized she's only been a pro player for about a month now. Of course, she's the NCAA's all-time leading scorer. And even if she's only 15th in the WNBA in scoring, I mean, she's third in three-pointers, she's fourth in assists. Uh, but of course, who do you take off if she goes in? I mean, it's a very tough question. Now, there's plenty of outrage over this. I mean, mainly because she's the most popular player in the league, even if she is a rookie. But looking at the roster, they didn't choose anyone under the age of 26. I mean, she's 22. For her part, her comment is that she was excited for the women who made the team and isn't disappointed. She also said it's a little extra motivation for her, so she really took the high road here. There's actually a chance she could still go. If one of the players gets injured, uh, they have not listed who those alternates were. You would have to think she's at least in discussion for that. Shifting gears to hockey tonight, we have game two of the Stanley Cup Finals between Edmonton and Florida. Now, the Panthers shut out the Oilers in game one. What does Edmonton need to do to get on the board? Well, they've definitely got to figure out Florida goalie Sergei Brabovsky. I mean, he stopped all 32 shots. That's the first time Oilers have burned shut out this postseason. It's postseason. It's been more than two months. You'd have to go back to the regular season when Dallas did it to them early April. So it's very hard to do against Connor McDavid and Edmonton. They're the fourth highest scoring team in the league. But now Brabovsky, he's very good at stopping low shots around the pads. Around the 30 of the 38 goals he's allowed in the postseason, 22 of them have been up high. And I'm, of course, those aren't easy to shoot, of course. You run the risk of you know, shooting over the goal and missing it completely. So it's not easy for Edmonton in a number of ways. In any case, tonight's Finals game two is going to be in Florida, 8 o'clock Eastern time. Well, Davis, always thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news. For around the clock coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.